Anish is at the back to come up to the front, please. Uh, don't have yes, sir. Yeah, but I, a big, uh, big thanks to the TAs and, and Alicia for the help uh, for the meetings. A lot of you in the Group A series have met with Alicia and in, in the tutorial time, so thank you very much. I know you went well beyond what's expected. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. So Alicia and myself and Jasper will be around over the next few days if you've got other questions to ask by email and other exam. But uh, thank you very much, Alicia, for your help. We really appreciate it. Um, just in terms of some things, <laughs> some other administrative issues are uh, the course evaluations have got 55% of them of the class have done them. If you have not yet filled it in, please, uh, I would appreciate it if you do. Actually, what 55% is already much higher than the usual 30% that we normally get. So, um, but we are aiming for 70 in the department overall. If we can get that, that would be phenomenal. Um, then also on the course website, there's a link um, for peer evaluation course reflection. Many of you have already done that. Um, if you have not, let me just quickly explain. It's a it's a three part uh, uh, form that you fill out. One is on the course reflection, where you reflect on what you've learned over the past uh, three months here for N. You also evaluate your peers for the project's work, and then this, the last part is uh, just letting me know any improvements you'd like to see um, in this course for future years. And I'll talk a bit about uh, so far about fifty out of 90 students in the class have filled out that reflection. So I'll just quickly talk about what I have seen so far in the, uh, in the minutes. So let's just take a quick recap of 4N. Um, there's four major sections in the course. The first is the economics. So we want to keep our process operating profitably. We want to be in the black all the time and make sure that we're financially viable there. Um, next, we look at safety in the course. Um, now safety and economics, these two sections are taught traditionally in all engineering universities in Canada. Um, however, the two other topics that are not taught anywhere else are troubleshooting and operability. And I was speaking with the Dean of Engineering at Western on Friday, he was over here at Mac. Um, he, him and I collaborate on the statistics course, he uses my notes for the stats course and I use some of his notes for other courses. And uh, he was telling me that in his experience, he's been in for uh, 30 years or so that this, there's no other school in America that has a course like 4N. So it's a pretty unique to uh, MacMaster in terms of those topics. And uh, certainly what you'll see coming up is I'm going to expand the troubleshooting and operability portions in terms of the amount of time I spend on it in, in the next year and the future years. Um, so so those, just so you're aware of that. Um, and then the troubleshooting section we covered very briefly at the end. And then prior to that, the operability our process going in a flexible manner. And we looked at a number of important robust decisions that I'll touch on next. Um, what I've gathered from the evaluation so far is that a lot of you are surprised by how much you actually covered. Was the was a consistent theme through people's reflections was how much they were actually capable of doing. Um, there were a lot of assignments and tutorials that was not a complaint, but it was a remark that was made. People felt that there was maybe one or two too many assignments. Um, however, the counter to that was that you recognized that it helped you learn effectively, that you were constantly exposed to material. There was no chance to slack off and wait for a midterm to get your ass to get to learn the material. Like you had to look at it every week and keep up to date. So that is a very effective um, study technique as well known in the, in the learning literature as well, but that is, that is an effective way of doing it. And actually, for those who are taking 4C next term, uh, 4C is going to be totally restructured to, to go in that route as well. Um, so so we'll, we'll talk about it next year for 4C. But in terms of this course, that's a, a constant uh, a constant way that we've run this course. Maybe not always, but certainly in the past, there's been these uh, regular assignments that are very effective in helping me learn. Many of you were surprised by how much you actually knew. <laughs> Which is, um, I guess, we tend to see our, our fluid flow and thermal courses and process control courses heat transfer in isolation from each other. But um, you've got to realize how much you actually have covered over the four or five years that you've been here at the university. And bringing that all together into a unified way was, was helpful for many of you. Um, many of you have remarked that you've improved your skills in presenting to the class and, and your, obviously your writing skills for the cover letters and the answers for the assignments. 
Um, the assignments and tutorials are intentionally structured, and the SDL projects are intentionally structured, but there's no way that you can do all the work yourself. Now, many of you, myself included in undergraduate, I was the type of student who, was, who wanted to do everything and, and cover all the topics of the course. And, and many of you have said that in your reflection as well, that you recognize that there's no way that you could possibly cover everything. You have to delegate to, this, to your group members and trust your group members to do an effective job, which doesn't always happen. Um, so, so we have to relinquish that control sometimes a bit if, you're, if you've got that nature. Um, and, and it's an important skill to learn as well. When you're working in companies, you will be working in, in larger projects and teams bigger than five often. Um, and you're totally reliant on group members to perform. Dealing with that group dynamics is something that you have to learn. Um, some students remarked that they realized that this type of work is not for them. They, the last thing they want to do for the rest of their lives is control shooting processes or doing hazops or writing reports or working with the engineering economics. And, uh, and that's good, right? If you discover that now rather than later, that's, that's great. Um, there's many alternatives for your degree that don't require to do that. You could work in research area, you could work in uh, business and finance where you use your engineering knowledge, but not in the way that you've had to use it in this course. So if you realize that this style is not for you, then that's, that's awesome. Um, then the reputation of this course was a little bit different <laughs> from this year around. I, I gather that there was a different impression of what this course would be about. Um, however, in my mind, we're back on track to how it's always been in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. So, um, so what, what's been done in this course is how it will keep going again in the future with some minor changes. Now, let's just talk quickly about the group work some of your group reflections which have, have remarked on the fact that your group had inadvertently picked a really tough topic to study. Um, so that does happen. Some, some groups will, um, based on just simply a lack of knowledge, they pick a flow sheet that seems interesting, but once they start getting into it, they realize that there's no information available. There's no rate constants. There's no sizes of reactors. There's no flow rates and purities and, and dollars and information on costs and around some specialized units. Um, so so that's, they've had a tougher time. Other groups have had an easier time with that. Um, so what also has shown up is there were about three or four groups that had some very tough dynamics in terms of the interaction with their colleagues. Um, some of you were lucky that you picked groups amongst yourselves or just the people that you landed up working with seemed to work well together. But there were a few groups that had some issues uh, through this course. And um, those groups have learned a lot from how to deal with it. So, and as one student Mark remarked, is that they actually realized what that expression means that you're only as strong as your weakest link means now um, in terms of group, of, of group dynamics. But um, many, many, or most groups, I would say, had very successful collaboration. So that was that was good to hear. Uh, other people remarked they really enjoyed learning uh, to be a chairperson uh, and, and rotating that role around. So it was was interesting and, and handling that uh, gave them some good personal development. So that's that's good to hear as well. Um, some groups didn't have a chairperson at all for most of the course. Uh, they just simply just kind of worked through together on things by, I guess, some how groups tend to do that. They just kind of go together in some way without a, a, a guide or a leader. But um, for, for those groups that actually established a formal chairperson role, those uh, rotating uh, roles, they, they learned a lot. So in terms of SDL skills, um, many of you remarked that it was extremely challenging that you felt that there was no guidance given um, or minimal guidance given. And that's somewhat intentional. On, on for, for, for reasons that you will see when you start working in, in the future is that in companies you'll be working on projects where the ultimate end goal might be vaguely defined. Um, and it certainly was the case in this course as well. So it's, it, is a, it is somewhat an intentional feature of the way that I structured the course to give you limited pieces of information as, as needed. Um, since that happens most frequently as, as companies work through projects, the, the goals become clearer and clearer as you progress. Um, the open-ended assignments, in some cases, some were more open-ended than others. Uh, that was that was also int intentional, and will some people ask for a bit more definition on that in future years? But I will stick with with 
that open-ended nature. Um, since if you don't see it at all, uh, and you wait for it for the final project, that might be a bit too late. So we'll keep keep that going in future years. You were forced to use group work to complete that as those assignments, um, and so you relied on your group members to, to learn. Uh, many of you become very good at locating information on capital cost information and uh, particularly operating cost information, what's the price of various raw materials and so on, so on. Um, where do you locate rate constant information? That's been a good skill that many of the groups have learned. And then being able to distinguish with what I really need to get this report written versus what would be nice to have is, is also an important skill. Uh, given infinite time and resources, we all do amazingly well on our projects, but um, given time constraints and the reality of the fourth year environment and also in a company, we don't have those infinite resources. So we really do have to decide to cut out what is, what is nice to have sometimes. And many of you have said that you become a little more efficient at managing the time. Though we certainly don't make it easy for you in fourth year. Um, I am, uh, I've been asked by, well I've fed back the information that I received from many of you on your evaluations that the fourth year is extremely compressed at the end. And so the chair of the department and all the faculty are aware of that now. I raised that at the last departmental meeting and then I've been asked to establish a system to deal with that for next year. So I'm, I'm working on that. Um, and so there will be a, a calendar system that the faculty have to enter in when all their handouts, hand-ins are due and their percentage value for it so that uh, we don't get like three projects worth 30% all due on the last day of term. So, yeah, December 6th. <laughs> so we will get, um, we'll get that sorted out. So um, after 4N, you're going to be doing SDL. Um, this may be the first time you've ever had to learn on your own a bit. Um, maybe not, maybe you've seen a bit of this in 2G and um, some of the other courses in third year. However, in the future, you will be seeing this um, you'll be having to learn from the plant, paying attention to what the plant is telling you is, is really important. Um, running experiments on your plant, we'll talk about that in 4C, how to do that efficiently, but um, you, you, you learn from the plant by just observing it and by running experiments where you intentionally change variables. You talk with the experts, and that includes the operators, um, to find out more about and learn about the systems that you're working with. Uh, websites, company-sponsored courses and seminars, you'll, you'll sometimes get an opportunity, uh, though companies tend to scale back on that uh, these days, but if you do get the opportunity to attend courses and seminars and conferences, I highly recommend you do that. Um, you, learn, you learn a lot, you get out of your environment for one, and you get to meet people from other companies that are in your area. So if you attend a pulpit paper conference, you'll be meeting like-minded colleagues, but you'll be getting some very interesting insight. It's always surprised me at how much people are willing to share at conferences, even though they're competitors. Um, people will talk, and, and, and you will learn interesting things at these courses and seminars, especially if there are a course and seminar that's outside your company with other competitors present. If it's an in-house course, you, you'll learn something, but um, you get a lot more value from attending conferences and seminars outside your co company. So I highly recommend you take advantage of that. And then finally, um, you've learned how to read books and look up information in journal publications. Maybe not so much trade journals, we don't emphasize those too much in this academic environment, but um, some of the, the traditional engineering journals, the trade journals, are, by that I mean like, um, so AFCHE's uh, CEP journal, uh, Chemical Progress and Chemical Engineering Practice. Those are good trade journals, the oil and gas journal. Uh, these are not journals that, uh, University professors would publish in. Okay. These are traditional, uh, these are tra trade journals where practitioners publish in. Those are very valuable for you to look at in your future career. They often have far more useful articles on how to size equipment, how to operate equipment, how to troubleshoot and safety aspects around equipment. Whereas the traditional journal publications that you see stacked in the library, then, those are all for the academic areas. Um, so take a look at those and subscribe to those in your company. Many companies will pay for the subscription for you uh, for that trade journal. Okay, so let's just talk a bit about the exam. The four parts that we have to this course will feature in the exam. However, the economic section will be the smallest section for sure. We'll cover that adequately by the midterm. 
and it's been your SDL project report. So the remaining three sections then on safety, operability, and troubleshooting will feature prominently in the exam. Um, and then everything else we've covered in the tutorials and, and in class time is, is, is fair as well, including the project presentations that have been made over the past two weeks. Um, so in the economic section, we covered the first tutorial was a bit on personal finance. Uh, many of you remarked that that was very helpful and I'm glad, glad that worked out for you. Um, the idea of cash flows that we uh, segment our, our time into discrete periods and all the cash flows in and out that occur within a period are then summed up into one period next cash flow as if it occurred on the final day in that period. So we, we use that concept in this course. So that's that value CN, is the sum of all cash flows within a period summed up, whether it's positive or negative. And then we account for the time value of money with the interest rate I raised to the power of N. So, so that's uh, very, very comfortable for you now. The next step in economics was we looked at profitability estimation, uh, where we looked at payback times, and particularly we only looked at independent projects in this course, um, where we require the DCFRR to exceed the MARR, and we require the MPB to be greater than zero. So we require both those conditions to be true for independent projects. We did not look at evaluating mutually exclusive projects in this, in this course. I cut out that topic. Um, it is in the course notes, so if you do see it, they, um, you can skip over it, you won't be in the exam, but it is um, certainly something that you can read over if you, if, um, you need it for the future when you're working in a company. Um, then we looked at tax and depreciation, and, and the key point here is that they're always taken into account. We introduced the topic without tax and depreciation, we added in afterwards from a teaching point of view, but the reality is it's never okay to assume that tax and depreciation are negligible. Um, every financial decision is strongly affected by tax and depreciation. Uh, Sensitivity analysis is also an important part because prior to this, uh, we assume that we have a 100% certainty in all the values that go into our NPV analysis. And that's never true. So what we come to at the end then is evaluate what the effect of that assumption is. Knowing that I'm not able to estimate with good certainty what my capital costs are, what my operating costs are, what the lifetime of my plant might be. Those, those are variables, for example, that have, have a high degree of error and we want to ensure that you're still profitable despite the variability in your values. So you should have for your SDL project report, um, have looked at sensitivity analysis to, to see what the effect of the uncertainty is on the NPV. And then the final section in economics was considering capital and operating cost estimation, which uh, don't, everyone's comfortable now with the North Wales book. Um, uh, there was one comment in the evaluations that said the book is out of date. I would disagree with that. The book is not out of date. It's intentional that those values are in 1970 and escalated up to the future. I would say the book is not kept up to date in the sense that it doesn't have some of the more recent unit ops in it. But it's certainly not out of date. Some of the capital cost estimating tools like Icarus that you've been using and in all the other textbooks, Behind the scenes, they all have everything backdated to 1970 and escalated up to future time. Um, and that's just how the capital cost estimation literature works. So it's not out of date, but it's not up to date. I, I agree with that sentiment. Um, next, we looked at process safety. There's uh, the hierarchy that has been considered. Many groups in their presentation have spoken about this. So we've got our basic control system where we're aiming to keep our variable around some nominal set point. And this variable will be controlled and brought back into that set point target with our regular feedback control system. So this is 3P and 4 material over here. However, if this variable is not brought back to our set point within a reasonable time frame and starts to deviate above a higher limit, so here's where we would like to be, and here's my higher alarm limit, then the moment I deviate above that alarm limit, I set off audible and visual alarms in my control room. I can acknowledge that alarm, by, or the operator can acknowledge it, and it will temporarily go away, however there might be a flashing light that's still remaining. 
as long as that variable is above the long level. If the operators get um, that variable taken care of, that visual alarm will go away as well. And we'll still get back down here to set point where we'd like to be. If they're not able to get below that alarm level, then we get to the SIS level where we have an automated system that kicks in with really where we, there's, we can't, can't do anything to stop it. It is intentionally made to kind of almost save us from ourselves. Uh, so it's a system that brings in action to the process that can often be fairly um, intensive and set you back in production. But it's intentional so that we do not get to a point that's escalated beyond that. So hopefully that SIS system is able to counteract this disturbance. So in particular, when we're looking at variables here that, that deviate are variables that have this high range. Certain variables don't have this ability just to keep going up and up. For example, the flow variable. There's a finite capacity that we have on flow. Our pumps and our valves are sized so that they can only go from low flow to high flow. They, just, they cannot just keep going up and up and up. But many other variables are of the type that can go up with, with fairly unlimited down. So temperature, pressure, and level are, are examples of those variables that can just keep going and going beyond. But some variables, just by their very nature, are uh, finite. So if our safety interlock system, which is an automated computerized system, is not able to, to get us back, uh, we then move to another level which is totally automated. Sorry, it's totally not automated, it's manual. So burst valves and relief valves uh, would kick in there to, to try and offset that, uh, that deviation that we've done. And finally still then, we need a level above that containment to handle that material that's being uh, vented now. So these valves and diaphragms are sized appropriately for the maximum or worst case flow that we would possibly expect. That material that's flowing out through that valve that needs to be contained in some way, or vented, or flared, um, or stored in a sump, or a tending dam, or some, some form to deal with later on. And then the final level, which we don't deal with in this course, is uh, how to interact with uh, third-party emergency response. So, so those, those are the hierarchy that we considered. And then we moved to uh, a very brief discussion of um, uh, checklists and relative ranking. So these are lists that we can go through to get a very rough idea of the system safety. Yeah, sure. And then what we did spend more time on, and you did in your report as well, was looking at hazard and operability study. So there's the two parts there. There's the hazard analysis and there's the operability. Um, and what you find is that in most cases that if you solve the hazard, we also intend to improve the operability of the process as well. And then we also looked at the BP case study at the um, one of those tutorials. Then the operability section of the course, we considered only a few of the operability topics. There is a lot more to it, and I will uh, in future years certainly cover more of more operability. But essentially, operability comes down to the fact that we recognize our plant must be able to operate and work over a range much, much greater than what we intended it for um, based on the original design. So that design base case is really not what we designed the plant for. We should design and we do design our processes to operate over wider ranges. Uh, so the operating window is an important first step in establishing what those bounds are. Uh, then we looked at a bit of flexibility and controllability. We considered what degrees of freedom it meant. Uh, what's manipulated, what's controlled, we need valves for every variable that we control. So we'll find the control elements. Uh, many of you looked at reliability in your PNIDs and in your SDL reports, where you looked at series of parallel structures of pumps and heat exchangers and so forth. Uh, duplicate units, duplicate furnaces. So here, for example, even at McMaster and other places, uh, we have duplicate uh, boilers to handle that reliability step in our process. And we can do that quite easily because we've, over many years, over 100 years of, in the chemical industry, we've got good data now to, to support and estimate what the reliability of individual units are. So units that are typically uh, fail within less than a year or two are often redundantly implemented. So pumps and valves, uh, given some of their fairly high failure rates compared to, say, vessels and reactors, we would uh, tend to put those in duplicate, whereas you wouldn't put a duplicate reactor in place. 
Um, but uh, pipes and uh, sorry, valves, I'd say, and pumps and so forth that fail a bit more frequently, we don't want that to stop our processes. So we've got those data, we've got good tables that tell us what the reliability of, of various units are. And based on that, we can go set up these series parallel structures and numerically evaluate what their new reliability is by putting them in series in parallel. We saw a bit of that in the previous group's reports uh, presentation just there. Uh, we looked at efficiency, uh, where we do things like heat integration, where we vary recycle ratios to get to, to better efficiencies. But that introduces all sorts of other problems as well. Um, it may start at the shutdown a little harder, so we have to bear that in mind. But uh, it's easy to, to accommodate for that. We put in bypasses and we add, um, add, add those bypasses around the recycle loop. So we showed in the, in the last section of operability how we can add a bypass around our recycle points and can exchange around our recycle points to start up and shut down those processes. And then um, for those of you that work with batch continuous processes, so for example, the group that did the steam whistle project showed that on that interface between batch and continuous operation, that you have storage vessels then to, to uh, disconnect you and, and basically give you that, that ability to operate from a batch mode and transition over to continuous mode. And then storage um, is also useful, even on continuous only processes, to, to uh, decouple sections of the process so you can shut down all the municipal maintenance but still be able to operate your downstream units. Okay, and then unfortunately the section on troubleshooting, we, we had little time in class to, to do this and um, actually previous years what's been done is there were two troubleshooting tutorials. So the first one was uh, how we had it and then there was a second one for to, 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 try, to try it a second time. Um, so we, we didn't have enough time this year to do that. Also what we tended to do in previous years was we had a troubleshooting tutorial in class first where the whole class troubleshoots the same case study with I would be up at the front to be the expert system and the whole class would be the troubleshooters. Um, we, all, we also don't have time to fit that in. So unfortunately, you've kind of been a little shortchanged on the troubleshooting section, but you have um, many new groups. I've been surprised at your level of enthusiasm at doing that in your SDL report, which was, a, was an optional um, section, but I know that many of you have done it. So that's that's great to see. Um, and 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 you certainly recognize that being able to troubleshoot effectively is an important skill as, a, as an engineer. So, so definitely uh, you will have ample opportunity to do this in practice. I know from uh, talking with colleagues previously, they say about 80% of their time working in a company is spent troubleshooting. And then the rest of the time is working on new projects and bringing in new, new ideas and product. But most of the time you're troubleshooting existing equipment and fixing existing problems. So it is an important skill that you will have many, many chances to, to work on it and improve yourself over the years. Um, just in terms of the exam, but also even in the future, that guideline handout that I had for you in the troubleshooting tutorial, hopefully most of you kept a copy of that. Um, if you've lost it, you can download it from the website, but that will be helpful for you um, in the exam and in the future as well to, to work on troubleshooting. Okay, so then, in terms of the final exam, it is on Monday, 17th of December. I think that's the wrong time. I think it's actually 12 um, But But uh, please check the website as you would anyway. You can bring in any printed material. Uh, so it's a totally open book. No electronic devices, unfortunately, except the calculator. And any calculator is, is OK. Um, you can write a pencil. Um, but uh, just make sure it's some it's fairly dark. Some some people have bright and pencil. It's incredibly light and it's hard for us to read. Uh, but but it is okay. You can answer your questions in any order. I would emphasize that you answer in short points, bullet points. I uh, don't use long paragraphs. I know some of you think you need to do that. However, um, really it's totally acceptable to write short, brief answers. What we're after is to see that you actually understand the material, not that you can write. Them beautiful paragraphs. You've done that many, many times in the assignments and cover letters now and in the report. So that's not part of it. Um, this last point is important. If something is unclear or seems to be 
athlete, which is very likely given the nature of this course and what we're focusing on here, uh, make reasonable assumptions. You saw that already in the midterm for the question on the Halloween candy, um, where there was nothing said to you that you had to assume tax and depreciation. Um, so you must make reasonable assumptions and continue on with the question in many situations. The tax rate may not be given, so assume a reasonable tax rate. Assume a reasonable value of time value of money. Okay, so um, if they're not given, we, we know now from this course what reasonable values are. So you are capable of making those assumptions and working to uh, In terms of preparation for the exam, I would highly recommend you read Dr. Marlin's notes. So there's two parts to the materials. There's usually Dr. Marlin's slides, and then there's his notes, which is long written out uh, chapters of the book that he's working on that will be published in the next year or so. Um, so he's kindly given me those chapters to include in the notes, and there's three chapters, one on safety, one on operability, and one on troubleshooting. Um, those are the material I've been using to teach from, um, the slides obviously as well, but then the, his notes are I've been then using to form what I teach from. So I would recommend that you, you read those if you haven't done it already for the STL project. Uh, and also review any of the slides and materials that are on the course website. Okay, so uh, then just to end off here, so thanks for your patience on, on, on this course. Some of the aspects of this course didn't go as smoothly as I'd hoped, so some of the delays in the grading, particularly the bit. So the TAs generally got the assignments graded in time. Yasser was sick for a week, a week or two, the midterm, so there was some delay there as well. Um, I really appreciate a lot of the evaluations and feedback that you've given me through the course website. So here's what I plan to do differently next year. Um, I will have more frequent group check-ins, so yes. peer evaluations to kind of identify some of the more dysfunctional groups earlier on. Unfortunately, I, all the groups that didn't quite work out, I found out like, pretty much only this week about it. So I hope in the future to identify that earlier on, and so I implement that change. Um, to spend more time on troubleshooting and operability. Then, um, in terms of the presentation, scheduling, and timing, I, I'm looking at some ideas around that, just to improve that. I wasn't quite comfortable with just blocking off two weeks here at the end for presentations. I felt it didn't work as successfully as I'd hoped, but um, I've got a few ideas around that that I may implement. Um, a, lot of, a few people did remark that they found the material very heavily bias towards distillation columns, oil and gas industry. That is true. It comes from the fact that uh, the material was prepared by Dr. Marlin, and that's his background. Um, the reason also why that tends to happen in chemical engineering in general is because these units, such as a distillation column and some of the separators that you look at, are, are a good example of integrating heat transfer, mass transfer, fluid flow, in a single unit. So we cover a lot of bases with these single unit examples. Um, and it's also something that we don't need to explain from scratch what a distillation column is every time you use it as an example, where a bioreactor might need a bit more explained to some members in the class, or a pulp and paper digester and its purpose might take a bit more explaining to, to get going. But it is no excuse really to, um, to introduce a small variance in the, in the example, and so I will work on improving the course notes next year on that. I will also, um, two or three people have suggested that I use the CEDA textbook that you use in your third year course, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Uh, I am, am speaking to Dr. Mahalik and integrating 4W a bit more with this course, so it may be that next year the projects in, in 4N are the same projects that are looked at in, in 4W, so you kind of get a 2 for one going. Get a lot of the work and, and SDL and looking up information out of the way for 4W already. Um, so we're looking at this one. And however, um, people said cut back on the assignments and tutorials. Uh, I'm reluctant to do that for some reasons that I mentioned. I, I feel for a four credit course, this is a fair amount of work that uh, is, is required. Um, so thank you very much for all your all your help with this course and all the feedback. I'll see most of you, I guess, in 4C. And um, I think, as the slide says, you're ready for 4W. Okay. So thank you very much.